Hey, this is Matt. Once again, welcome back to another video. There's another paid request. This time for. Sorry, I'm, I'm going to screw up this name. I apologize. Charon Charon Jeev, C H A R A N J E E V, Char Charon Jeev, Charon Charon Jeev, Charon Jeev. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. But he sent in a paid request. Thank you so much for that. And for those interested in requesting. Whether it be a reaction, a review, a re-review, a topic, a ranking, a list, randomness, commentary, out of the blueness, whatever it may be, pretty much anything, <coughs> feel free to send it either directly to my PayPal or join my Patreon. Both links are down below in the info box under the video. Now this is for the film <coughs> The Man from Earth from 2007. Now this is a film I had never heard of, but apparently looked into it, it Got a little bit of a cult following. Uh, there was a sequel that came out that everybody said was crap. I did look into it and it, it does seem like pretty crappy. So I'll stick with this one. This one showed what you could do with a tiny budget. And it's mainly based on dialogue. Well written dialogue. Good set of actors. This is science fiction at its bare minimum. And it's not going to be everyone's cup of tea. I, th I can see a lot of people find this boring. How a lot of times I would think this is boring. But when you have a movie that's very dialogue heavy, it's risky. But it could be, in a weird way, rewarding. Okay, for example, Clerks. Different type of movie, but very dialogue heavy. Very simple, low budget. Uh, Twelve Angry Men, which I think someone asked me if I had ever if I had ever seen it, and it wasn't until after I'm like, wait, I did see that. I especially liked the remake with Jack Lemmon and Jorcey Scott and Tony Danza, and uh, I don't know if the remake of Twelve Angry Men's on DVD. If so, I like to pick it up. It's actually directed by William Friedkin. Who did the French Connection and and others? That's a really good movie. I know there's the original Twelve Angry Men with Henry Fonda, but I really like the remake because you have a great cast. Also, there's this film called The Last Supper from 1995 with Courtney B. Vance. I think he's in that, or he's in Twelve Angry Men as well. Am I getting confused? The Last Supper is a film from 1995 where it's about a group of people that. They start inviting folks, and they get into these debates. If they deem this person a bad person, they will poison the person. So if they get someone who's like a racist, or they get someone that's different viewpoint, they'll poison them and kill them off. And that's an underrated film, The Last Supper. That's an interesting movie. Ron Perlman's in it. Does a really good job. Oh, uh, guy from Charlie's Angels. And there's something about Mary. Cameron Diaz, she's in it. Again, underrated. I would say Charon Jeeve, if you like small films with dialogue heavy stuff, check out The Last Supper from 1995. You may like that one. But I know I'm three minutes in, I haven't gone to this. This is written by a guy named Jerome Bixby. Now, Jerome Bixby apparently. In 1998 or something, like on his dying bed, like he wrote this script. And it wasn't until 2007 this got made, or released. And Jerome Bixby was a writer of Twilight Zone and Star Trek. Like he came up with the story way back to the day of the Twilight Zone. Remember the story that was in the movie with the little kid who has all the powers... And everyone had to be really super nice. And yes, they remade it. And one one of the segments in Twilight, Twilight Zone, the movie. Jerome Bixby came up with the original idea. And also for Star Trek, he wrote episodes including Mirror Mirror. With the alternate Kirk and alternate Spock. And so he wrote that episode of Star Trek. And I'm like, okay, this is definitely a guy that knows how to write science fiction. And the director is a 
kind of a strange choice, Richard Shankman. <laughs> Richard Shankman, before this, did Playboy videos. Playboy videos. And nowadays, he produces documentaries for the company MVD. Like Richard Shankman, Shankman, the director of this, produced the documentaries for Double Impact and Lionheart and the Billy Blaine's film Showdown and the stuff in Double Dragon, the making of that, for the MVD DVD Blu-ray company. So, I thought that was interesting. Now, the actors, you have David Lee Smith, who's a new guy, but he does a really solid job as the lead. But you have Tony Todd, Candyman himself. You got William Cat, and this underrated from this underrated film House from the eighties. He was also on this TV show, The Greatest American Hero. Um, you have a few others. At first, about six people, seven including our lead, and then later on, another person comes in. So I know I'm six minutes in. What's the story about? It's very simple. David Lee Smith plays a professor who is moving away. And his friends, about six of them, come by. And, and he once played by Tony Todd, who's kind of the voice of reason. William Catt is the guy more prone to anger. Uh, you have this other guy who I enjoyed very much, John Billingsley, who was on one of the Star Trek TV shows. He was very funny, very humorous. I liked a lot of his uh, witty dialogue. He was a lot of fun. You have this older lady who's fairly religious. You have this one girl who's in love with our lead. And then you have this student that went with William Cat to, to be there. And they're kind of curious, why is this professor moving away? It's been ten years. You have a great here. And our professor, I'm just going to call him by his real name, David Lee Smith. He just said, oh, you know, I like to move around. You know, I'm glad you guys went, came by to say goodbye. And then they start pushing, like, why? Come on, come on, what's what's the deal? Are you sick? Are you this or that? Until ultimately, he's like, okay, I mean, I wasn't thinking of telling you guys. I, I, in fact, I rarely tell anybody about this, but I am a caveman. Who is 14,000 years old. And you go from these people. Okay it's a prank right. To. Oh my god he believes this. He's sick in the head. To. Some of them might even be close to believing this guy. And the rest of the film is just this one location. And people having. Conversations. Very intellectual. Very. Fairly well thought out. And David Lee Smith did a great job because he plays it calm enough and the responses come so easily. It's like, wow, he, he like has an answer for everything, but yet it's making sense. Like someone goes, well, what ha oh yeah, you're 14,000 years old. Well, what happened and what were you doing in 1292? And David Lee Smith looks at her and goes, okay. This time last year, what were you doing? Like, oh, well, you can't remember from one year ago, but I'm supposed to remember from hundreds of years ago. And they're having this intellectual conversation that goes from, okay, let's play along to see what's going on, to, okay, we'll play along to just maybe sick in the head, to even anger. Like, are you fucked with us? Or... You know, as people, some of the characters say, there's no way to prove it, but is there really a way to disprove it? Well, I mean, you know, with the aging, I mean, technically, if there's something wrong with them where they have a perfect detox, and you duck the, the decaying process, and, well, technically, we could live to, like, 190 years old, but... You know, by the time we're born, we're polluting our bodies. <laughs> Case in point. 
So then we start the destruction decay of our bodies. And then they start, okay, let's ask him about his life. And he talks about, you know, vagueness. But also he explains why it's vague. And he's like, wow, it actually makes sense. You know what? This is a good version of that fucking bullshit time traveler movie I saw on 2B TV. I ranted on a week or two ago. This is actually from someone who knew what the fuck they were doing writing-wise. Now, to be fair, Richard Richard Chankman is director. Anybody could have directed this. I'm sorry if the guy sees this. Anybody could have directed it because this is like a stage play. You let the actors follow the dialogue. And you just set the camera. And there you go. Some up close shots, maybe some wider shots, but it's not like the direction has any camera work or angles or any artistry with it. I mean, no disrespect to Richard Chankman, but I'm just saying, anybody, my friend Michael, the choice voice, could have directed this, and he he directs fan films, Star Trek fan films, actually. My point is, anybody could have directed this. It's the writing and the actors that make this film work. And I stress that because Richard Chankman went on to direct a sequel, which of course wasn't written by Jerome Bixby because he had passed away. And I flipped through it, and that piece of shit. And the ending leaves stupid sequel bait. Cause, and then the director's like, we did this. Because we want to make more movies, or maybe a TV show. Please, go to this page and donate if you want. And I'm like, oh, okay. I see how it goes. Huh. But, this was all, it was interesting to see where it was leading to. And I just, I like the actors. I said, John Billingsley was funny. Tony Todd Always great to see Tony Todd. I love Tony Todd. From the Final Destination films to Candyman, the actual real Candyman, to Night of the Living Dead from 1990, which he did a wonderful job in that. You know, The Rock with Sean Connery and Nick Cage. Always great to see Tony Todd. And he has a lot to work with. He's one of the bigger parts. Yeah, he... It's not like he's put in the background of the friends. He's one of the ones that talks the most, which is great. Because it's just... It's a, it's a good usage of Tony Todd. It is a very intellectual movie. It is a movie that... I understood what was going on. I wasn't confused. But yeah, it's not going to be everyone's cup of tea. Because... To me, it was fascinating with how David Lee Smith played it. Where... You kind of get why some people kind of, wow, he's just answering these questions, and when I ask him something, he always has an answer for everything, and like he's telling the story about how he almost sailed with, almost sailed with Columbus, and uh, how he actually talked to a Van Gogh, the painter, and how he actually went east to study with the Buddha, and... It's interesting to see where the conversation goes into. Oh, you know, this is stupid. You know, all these other people, they wouldn't believe it. And then, I think it's the lead guy. Someone asks, How many of you guys know five geniuses that you disagree with to the point of being absolutely pissed off at them? And those are geniuses that you think are wrong and you think they screwed up. So, if those five geniuses you think are so wrong, how you know this isn't the case? You know, why don't you test, get tested? Because I don't want to be found out and be put into a lab and be tested on and locked up. And this is why I move every ten years, because by that point people recognize I'm aging. And... <laughs> I do think the movie lost a little bit of its way when they introduce a new character, which is William Cat 
spoiler, does I do, like my friend Michael, the choice voice, and other people, I recommend it, it's for free on YouTube, apparently, when they released it, they released it for free, pirated, and other stuff on purpose, and that's how so many people were able to see it, but it's for free on YouTube, I recommend for anyone who likes intellectual sci-fi, and conversation, and yes, this is the example of me enjoying the film. No, it does not need action and gore. I love that stuff, but I can enjoy other type of films if it's done well. This is written well with a pretty damn good cast as an interesting subject that because of the way these pe these people interact with each other makes me intrigued to see where it's leading up to for the next topic of the conversation whether history or geography or religion, all that stuff. But, spoilers starting now. There's another, like I said, William Cat calls someone, it's a psychiatrist played by Richard Reel, which, some people may recognize this guy. I think he was in Hatchet. He was one of the older folks that got killed early on. If you remember The Fugitive... With Harrison Ford, on the prison bus, there's this old guard who Harrison Ford asked for help, and it, and the guard's like, fuck you, and runs off, and then when he's telling the story to Tyler Lee Jones, he's making shit up, and then that's where Tyler Lee Jones, well, it's funny, we got, you know, chains with no prisoners in them. <laughs> That old prisoner, the old prison guard is, that's Richard Real. He's been in a lot of other stuff too in bit parts. He comes in and, uh, I don't really think you needed him in the movie. I, I mean, not that he was bad. It's just with the other actors we already have there, it's just he comes in and then he starts asking questions about his father but then he starts getting to his own problems where his wife just passed away and he has a heart condition. Then he drives off. Then like 20, 30 minutes later he comes back. And uh, he was better in that portion later on. But then at one point he has a gun on him. But then you find out that the gun's empty. And then later on when he comes back he apologizes. I, like, I don't know if this stuff was really needed. Like, all that anger could have just been William Cat. Because that's kind of the sad thing, is that when Richard Reel's doing that, William Cat is kind of put in the background. Because at first, he was the guy that was getting angry. I'm like, just put all that stuff with William Cat's character. Just have William Cat... Hell, if you want the same dialogue, just have William Cat say that same dialogue. But the reason that Richard Reel in there is for the end of the film. Of it, which I did that whole thing at the very end. I thought was the one weak point in the movie that you didn't need. In my opinion, you did not need that. But like I said, I did like the dialogue. I went down to the religion aspect. Then there's a super spoiler starting out. You come to find out that, in a way, the way David Lee Smith tells it. He kind of inspired the idea of Jesus. And of course, the religious lady don't like that. You're not Jesus. It's like, well, I mean... I had studied with the Buddha, and I went over there for these Buddhist teachings, and it was Rome, and they got mad. And no, there's none of the fairy tale stuff, but they didn't nail me. They tied me up, but nailing, that was that just more theatrical to put into later and my name is was it I think John was his name but then I got misspoke to Josh but then it got to this to Jesus then it just got to Jesus I do like John Billingsley taking the piss out of it going <laughs> man there's all these guys thinking that you know Jesus was black or Asian or or all this stuff. Now we can, you know, or an alien. Now we can add, 
you know, he was, maybe he was a caveman. <laughs> I, I, like, John Millinsley is there to just, he's having fun with this whole thing, even if he's believing it more or less, he's still taking the piss out of it, which is great. But it does have some nice, <coughs> poignant moments to me. Like this about religion. Where they're talking about, you know, how religion gets twisted. And he said, it's about the mistakes they bring to the lessons. Which is true. For some reason, that line stuck with me. The, the mistake they bring to the lessons. Like, the lessons are fine, but it's the mistake you bring to them. And how religion can help cause a lot of war. I remember I said that one time and someone got pissed. That's not true. You never heard of the Holy Wars? You think a lot of wars and because of religion and because they don't want beliefs one or the other pushed down their throat? Yeah, there's other stuff like land and other stuff, but religion is a part of it and is a big part of it. And if you don't think it is, you feel free to do research. And he even says a lot like fairy tales, they build churches. I just see some people very into Christianity, Christianity getting pissed at this, but it's only a movie. It's only a movie. But again, super spoilers at the end. Uh, the religious girl is crying. The psychiatrist is like almost threatening him to put him in the loony bin. And so the lead guy says, it was a prank. It was a prank. I want to see how far you guys would believe me, blah, blah, blah. But, you, you know, you read audience know that he wasn't pranking. And I, I think I got the idea that Tony Todd still believed in him. The girl that loved, was in love with our lead character, and Tony Todd. I think Tony Todd, did part of him did still believe him. At least I like to think it. I don't know why you make a sequel you don't bring back Tony Todd. That's another reason why that sequel can eat itself. The movie didn't need a sequel. But the guy, Richard Shankman, obviously, oh, this has a little bit of an underground buzz, so let me try to make some quick cash off it. Hey, it's his right, but doesn't mean it's good. And I don't want to see the sequel all the way through. I saw bits and pieces. It was enough. I don't want to see it. So. It makes my fucking nose allergic. Because I'm allergic to that bullshit. But this one. Like the ending. Again, I was talking about Richard Reel. That's why I said super spoilers. When everyone leaves. It's the girl that he loves. Or that loves him. And Richard Reel. And then our lead is talking with the guy about other names he's had in the past and one of them Richard Real recognizes was the name of his dad 60 years ago that abandoned him and how convenient enough this character was Richard Real's dad 60 years ago and knows all this information that Richard Real about Richard Real that no one else would know I'm like okay that's the only reason this character's in here And you really didn't need it. I'm sorry, you didn't need that. Because then Richard Real has a bad heart. He dies of a heart attack. And then uh, the girl mentions, in 14,000 years, this is the first one of your kids you saw die. He's like, yeah. Right, he still doesn't have a lot of emotion, probably because after 14,000 years, your emotions probably have dulled a lot. But at the same time, I'm like, this stuff wasn't needed. You could have easily just had the six friends, and there's more anger and more hostility, one versus the other, believer, non-believer, in the story, and then the lead guy sees all this friction. He said, wait, 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 okay, I made it up. I made it up, okay, I made it up. And that's all you needed. And then you could leave it to up to the viewer. Whether he didn't make it up, up or he didn't make it up. 
It's down to Tony Town, the girl believe in him, and then it's up to the viewer. Do you believe him? Do you not believe him? Or you, there's something other simpler thing that you could have done, like a photograph. He could have had some fucking photograph from 1492. Yeah, it could be his ancestor, but it could be him as well. Like, like a box of photographs, of all these old photographs. Yeah, they could be doctored. But I mean, like, it, you could have just had something much more simple, much more, I don't know, just... I, you, you did not need the Richard Real character in there. But like I said, the rest of it, the dialogue, the interactions, the debates, it was interesting and it was a bit different. It was a bit different, and Jerome Bixby, may he rest in peace, showed that he was a damn good writer. That just based on this dialogue alone, I can't be intrigued to see where this was going. So, at the end of the day, I thought it was an interesting take on sci-fi. Simple, very simple, very basic, but nicely done, for, for the most part. Like I said the direction, the music, just nothing to run home about. Run, run home about. Blah, 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 blah. But yeah, I did like it. I did. I did like it. So with that said, thanks for watching. Take care. We'll see you guys later. Bye bye.